in times of crisis, I think is incredibly important. And that is massive utility. I think when you're thinking about the the creator economy, the power of, you know, women to just launch an NFT collection and become artists at the privacy of the rural home in the middle of nowhere and leverage that as a way to build generational wealth for their families is definitely a story that you're not hearing, but that's the story I'm seeing on like NFT women Twitter. Welcome to The Feedback Loop, a Sino-Global Capital podcast where we keep you in the loop about the most pressing issues in Web3 today. I'm your host, Mona Hamdi, a Harvard teaching fellow with 20 years of experience in nonprofit and sustainable development. I started using emerging technologies 15 years ago, working with remote peoples to create new economies based on the reversal of climate change. And today, I'm the Chief Strategy Officer at Sino, where I hope to bring beneficial technologies to the most forgotten corners of this planet. On today's episode, I am joined by renowned connector, public affairs expert, crypto head, environmental advocate, and gelato connoisseur, Anastasia Delaccio. She's the, an external affairs expert. She specializes in global public policy, social impact initiatives, and campaigns related to the organizing and, and empowerment of women. She's the founder of WCoin, the Women's Crypto Organizing and Investment Network, and was the director of public policy for for Core Scientific. I'm really excited to have Anastasia with me today on the feedback loop. I want to talk about the environmental impact of crypto, the innovation economy, her work around community um, engagement in the civic sector, the private and public sector around the industry, and want to get right into it. Hey there, Anastasia. How are you? Hi. Thanks so much for having me today. This is exciting. I can't wait to get to to all the good stuff, including this, uh, this little gelato fetish that you have. But before we get there, you're really known for the potential of crypto, for what you see as its ability to close gaps instead of widening them, to bring people and marginalized communities together. Tell me about how we can be more intentional with that and with your background, how it brought you to where you are today. A lot of my my background and career has been spent around thinking about how to leverage new technology in order to solve for some of the world's most pressing challenges and problems. And when I kind of discovered crypto, um, I quickly fell into the rabbit hole and, you know, as a policy wonk uh, beyond a bear market, uh, really started to think about, you know, harmful regulation or misinformed regulation as being one of the biggest threats to the industry. And as I began to dive in and wanted to talk about it with all of my friends, I realized none of my girlfriends really knew anything about it. You know, I really started seeing it as, you know, in, in past with every su- sort of new um, era of innovation or economic mobilization, you know, women weren't always at the table. They weren't always able to even vote. And and now we have an opportunity to really level the playing field, um, whether it's through entrepreneurship and developing crypto companies, or whether it's just through investing, whether it's through leveraging the technology to transform generational wealth for our families as mothers. Um, and, And why was it that in an issue area that seems so complex, but isn't really like overly complex, I I couldn't understand why women, more women weren't diving in. Um, And so I kind of decided, okay, I want to start this group, one, so I could meet more women in crypto. Uh, But two, um, I also kind of identified another problem in this space as it related to just the gender balance and just the way industry was thinking about advocacy and mobilization to begin with. Whereas, you know, there were women who were leaning in um, and they were doing so as artists and collectors, but no one was really thinking about how do we mobilize this community as civically engaged people um, to advocate and educate around the potential uh, for, for crypto. So that's how WCoin was really born. Um, and I really am using it as a mission-driven way to educate, uh, mobilize, and activate more women and allies in the space. Where do you see it going? I mean, since you created WCoin, which it was roughly two years ago or at the end of 2021, right? There have been pivotal changes, and I know that's really been a, a focus, and WCoin has played a large, a large part in that, in showing that, I mean, my truth 
was that all of my mentors, men, most of them were women, right, in coming up in the space. I think of women who are now just, whether it's um, advocacy or regulation or actually um, developers, policymakers, legislators, attorneys, all really early in the crypto space and largely women. And you're right, when you go to events or when you see the experts, the sage on the stage, as it were, they were largely devoid of women. Where do you see us now and how do you see the growth of this? I guess being in D.C., I started to realize that although the the ecosystem largely, I think, even outside of D.C., when you go to Consensus or Bitcoin Miami or a lot of these events, it, is, it seems like it's overwhelmingly men. And maybe it's because from the, the technology side, um, a lot of the developers are overwhelmingly men. And bringing more women into the step pipe, STEM pipeline, like that's a whole other ball game. But what I began to see, at least here, is that really women were actually leading, um, whether it was on the Hill, you know, thinking about uh, Senators Gillibrand and Lemus taking the reins, authoring one of first pieces of bipartisan legislation, which may not see the light of day anymore, <laughs> uh, but really taking that leadership <laughs> to band together and come together um, to really do something about the space. And then thinking about who are the women actually leading a lot of the public public policy in companies and all of the top companies, it seemed to be women. All of the major associations, whether it's the Blockchain Association, the Digital Chamber, the Crypto Council for Innovation, they're all being led by women. So it's interesting to see more women taking initiative and leading in the space. But I still think there's a major gap of, you know, you've got certain women leading these areas, but there's not enough women in the conversation more broadly, especially ones that are happening in public policy circles, really right. talking about the transformative power of crypto or NFTs uh, for women and how they are taking the range and really leveraging it to transform their lives and their families and their careers. You were really involved with with the particular part of the industry in terms of crypto mining. In the mining industry or the mining side, how was that representation split. Would you say that it was even more men than the rest of the crypto industry? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> because, you know, it's so funny that like, as I really started buying crypto and investing and being interested in the space, I got really into NFTs. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I loved about NFTs was it was this whole, you know, there's like crypto Twitter and then NFT Twitter, which was like so friendly and nice and, you know, all about, you know, my BFF and yeah. <laughs> um, world of women and, and empowering each other. Other, you know, I see like there's crypto Twitter and then Bitcoin, which Bitcoin is just completely, um, you know, Bitcoin Miami. It's just really hardliners, a lot of men, a lot of developers with very, very strong opinions about things. It is overwhelmingly men. Um, but for me, I've always been a wonk. And kind of the more technical an issue is, the more I want to dive in and become an expert. And I think as women, our expertise level has to just go like completely through the roof because mm. we're always having to prove ourselves in a room. And, you know, it's always like the guy who doesn't know nearly as much as me who wants to kind of mansplain what Bitcoin is and, and you know, how the mining process is. And, and, and you know, I love to be able to like throw down knowledge, but I, I, I'm not sure that everyone wants to kind of widen the table and hear all those perspectives and perceive women um, as, as that much as knowledgeable as, as, as the guys in the room. But yeah, I definitely... Uh, the, the Bitcoin stuff is is really really a, a different ball game than than NFT Twitter. <laughs> That's for sure. Yeah, for sure, for sure. When you were at do, focused on public policy in the mining industry, there were a lot of challenges, not just in the industry writ large, but also within mining itself. There was increased competition, declining profitability, all sorts of changes to um, staking methodologies. What do you see as the future? of crypto mining. What insights do you have for us and where you see the in the industry going in the coming years? What we're seeing now is obviously going to be some consolidation. There's been a couple of companies that have already declared bankruptcy. There's been a couple of, of companies that have consolidated and merged. I think we're going to see a continuation on that path. I also think that there's certain people on the Hill um, and, and, and elsewhere that haven't exactly hidden the fact that they want to come out there and and ensure that the industry is taking steps to 
um, put their money where their mouths is. So, you know, especially a lot of the U.S.-based companies, they really pride themselves on having a great mix of, of leveraging sustainable energy. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that we're going to see some regulation come down the pike, which is going to say, okay, we don't want to hear you just talk about it. We want you to be publishing exactly uh, what what the mix is and, and how you're more of moving towards um, 100% renewables. I'm not saying like super harsh regulation, would be totally beneficial, but it certainly would take the industry into a a, a better state than where it is now. You know, I will say also, like, you know, I live in D.C., and the the big headline over the past few weeks has been Amazon and the big data centers they're opening, and everyone keeps applauding it. So I bring this up simply because people don't really understand that Bitcoin mining is just data center management. And so why is it then when Google or Amazon, you know, they they launch these new data centers with green mixes, um, people applaud it, um, but they don't uh, when it comes to Bitcoin mining. So I do think there's a little bit of a scarlet letter problem. Um, And I, I, I also think in that regard, you know, would also behoove the industry not just to continue to move towards sustainability, but maybe go through a little bit of a PR exercise and rather than call it mining, um, which, you know, people who aren't educated think like my son, when I first got the job, he was like, so what is that? Do people go in the ground and take pickaxes to computers? And I'm like, wow, that's the visualization, right? If we only just called it, you know, data validation center or something like that to showcase that it's no different from other things that are out there. What is different is that unlike um, AWS and their data centers that cannot power off because who knows what would happen to the ambulances of the world or, you know, the government types of issues that they're they're powering. You know, Bitcoin can can turn off and on in, in a matter of five minutes and, and give power back to the grid. There's a lot of benefit that comes with that. And so I think it would behoove the industry really um, for a little bit of a rebrand. I'm from Brooklyn, New York, was raised in California, but I'm Arab American, where we are obsessed these days with uh, with the digital asset space as an emerging asset class around wrapping regulation around that. And it's so true what you're saying, because for us, where we mine petroleum or we have liquid natural gas platforms, mining is considered a sort of extension of that in many ways. And I think that, um, I don't think I had thought of that before, that maybe it is a bit, when you called it the scarlet letter problem, maybe there re- really is something profound about the labeling being around the environmental impact of it, that it being one-to-one mapped on mining. You're part of the Crypto Sustainability Coalition, so I'm not I'm not surprised to hear you talk about that. And I'm grateful, actually, because one of the other things that comes hand-in-hand hand in my part of the world is around carbon and the decarbonization of the industry. How do you see our industry truly moving forward in a way that's not just... Um, talking points or mealy-mouthed or, you know, just some sort of other PR exercise to ensure that we really are part of a cohesive and comprehensive climate solution. Yeah, well, I guess in in terms of the mining, I think that, and what you're seeing in Texas and elsewhere is that it really can be a critical part of the energy infrastructure. I think maybe the forced hands of whether it's Congress or elsewhere, putting targets on having, you know, moving the industry towards a sustainable future can only be beneficial. Look, like, you know, we have a movement towards EVs right now, but what people don't talk about is the batteries, you know? So there's always going to be, every every industry, there's always going to be some sort of unintended consequence of of everything. And, And I think at least with Bitcoin, You know, moving it into the future, utilizing more sustainable energy sources will only help the industry further and will also help accelerate our move towards a more green and innovative future as well. Um, The last thing I'll say is that it's a very new industry. And I mean, relatively new, right? Compared to oil and gas. No, for sure. Um, For sure. (laughs) And and the leaps and bounds it's made just in the past couple of years, specifically as China has has caused a lot of the the miners to flee, um, is that it's a robust, new, agile industry that is innovating in ways that many industries haven't yet and can't. And if we compare it relatively to other sort of Fortune 500 companies um, or industry, 
you know, the amount of progress the Bitcoin industry has made even in just two years, when you compare that to like the Exxons of the world, is pretty immense. And I think um, given the negative uh, view that so many policymakers and others have on the industry, um, it's, it's trying ever harder to kind of get there. And so... You know, again, I see it, especially as, you know, coming back to where we see it going in the future, I I, I really do see it as a PR problem a little bit, an education problem. And I think the industry needs to continue to do a lot of uh, what it's already doing. I know the Satoshi Action Fund and others are out there, uh, not just on a federal level, but on a state level educating. And, And part of that is the relabeling. Part of it is just figuring out how do we you know, open the the curtains a little bit and showcase what what Bitcoin mining is is really like, and talk to some of the grid operators and and people who are benefiting from it. Um, as you know, Bitcoin isn't just crypto; it's energy. Um, and I think that there is a lot of potential. But you know, as as long as we can continue to move that way, and and we may have to um, by default. So we'll we'll see where that heads but i i do hope it's it's in a i think i do believe it's in a good direction in your blog post and your writings on this you were still quite optimistic for the space for the fact that the technology can again bring people together as opposed to driving them apart that we can heal the environment and not hurt it where do you find that the education has been most effective what are your sort of wins whether it's from w coin policy work on mining Give me something to hang on to. What I would say is like the vision, at least, is that more needs to be done. And, you know, from what I'm seeing here in D.C., it seems like, you know, there's a ton of DeFi bros in town, like talking about the importance of DeFi, especially after tornado cash sanctions and and all of this stuff. And, you know, everyone's sort of like knocking the door around national security and and there's a lot of pushback in those those areas and efforts and you know I hear a lot in circles in DC that okay I understand the potential of blockchain but what's the purpose of crypto until we see utility you know there's going to be slow adaption what I would say though is that there's a lot of those stories about utility that just aren't being told and specifically I think a lot about NFTs here and you know beyond just like the market aspects. I consult with a lot of philanthropy who are saying, oh, these amazing artists are coming and and asking us if we can partner with them because they want to give us a percentage of their sales and their royalties. What does that mean? And I think the potential of NFTs to really disrupt philanthropy, um, you know, rather than uh, someone in the development at a nonprofit to have to constantly every year raise funds. It's so nice to have like a forever yes. amount of royalties be able to go back to great causes. Um, I think that you actually do see a lot of potential, you know, whether it's the recent earthquakes that we've seen in um, Syria and Turkey, um, whether it's the crisis in Ukraine, um, the ability for people to send money, have that as as, as a safe um, and stable bet, uh, or somewhat stable bet, um, you know, in times of crisis, I think is incredibly important. And that is massive utility. I think when you're thinking about the, the creator economy, the power of, you know, women to just launch an NFT collection and become artists at the privacy of the rural home in the middle of nowhere and leverage that as a way to build generational wealth for their families is definitely a story that you're not hearing, but that's the story I'm seeing on like NFT women Twitter. And then of course the environmental play and carbon credits and things of that sort. What I'm trying to say is like, these are the stories that I'm not seeing enough of on the Hill. And that's really where W Coin wants to help kind of change the narrative and and through advocacy and mobilization, because all of the companies are making their way to the Hill and they're all talking about why um, what they're doing is so important. Ultimately, what do policymakers care about? They don't really care about these companies. They care about their voters. They care about their constituents. And if it's really impacting them, those are the stories they want to hear. And so those are the stories we need to be closing the gap um, and bringing more of them onto the Hill, the ones of economic equality, the ones of people transforming uh, their careers, their selves, and, and so many other things. And, you know, the problem is, is that I feel like a lot of people are investing, they're collecting, they're being entrepreneurs, but they're not necessarily connecting that to their their civic duties. Um, and so, uh-huh. 
even if you can't get to Washington. And so here's my quick plug. And, and WCoin, we have an amazing resource page um, that can help you uh, reach out to your policymakers, um, as does Coinbase and so many others. Um, but it's not enough to just, you know, um, express your frustrations on, on Twitter. Um, you know, you should be writing tacti tactically, like beautifully crafted emails and notes and letters, um, you know, sending them off to your to your um, members of Congress. Um, they all have local offices um, and their job is to sit and listen to you. So if you're an NFT artist based in New York or California or Seattle or wherever you see um, sort of potential negative legislation coming through the pipeline, you know, make your voice heard. You, it's your civic duty. Um, and then obviously vote um, or run for office. So um, we, we have all sorts of resources on our site um, pointing to all of those things. And again, you know, I'm not... I think we're incredibly lucky to have all of these associations like the Digital Chamber and the Blockchain Association. And they're out there really, you know, grinding the pavement and doing like unbelievable work. Um, but they're really there representing industry. And and again, you know, unless unless these companies are based in, in legislators' districts, sometimes it's it's their constituents they want to hear from. And so if we really want to move the needle and, and educate in the right way, um, we need to do so. You know, I love that. It, re it does give me Obama's don't boo vote vibes. And I think yes. that, um, <laughs> which is important. I think that for Washington, D.C., you know, we have to really distinguish. Um, I think that there's a feeling of, helplessness and frustration in the industry because we found ourselves at the at the sort of within the crosshairs of different types of intersecting bodies that hold different powers and different sway in Washington and you seem very bullish on appealing to and educating the people who are elected by the people and not appointed by the representatives so you're reflecting what i see happening in Washington DC which is a, is a real focus on the legislative body of the United States, of the congressional powers, the lawmaking powers, and the appeal to the constituency or to the um, to the benefit of the citizens here. How do you see the powers that be in your work? Obviously, we've just come out of an incredibly tumultuous year for crypto, and so it's an uphill battle. And I think for there was a lot of optimism for a while, and then FTX happened, yeah. and so I think you know it's only kind of served to divide even more. And those that didn't like the industry now really don't like it. Um, and so there's a lot of work to do. But not only is there a lot of work to do and people think their job is to protect um, their constituents, right? On top of that, they have so many competing priorities. And being in the industry, obviously, we think crypto is the most important thing ever. But, you know, when you when you combine it with, with all of the other things um, that members of Congress really have to have to juggle and deal with right now. I think it is on a list of priorities. We'll see if they can get anything done. And until then, you know, we may see it uh, coming more from from the other side rather than the Hill. But that's hmm. why, you know, if, if members of Congress feel that they need to develop really restrictive regulations related to the industry in order to protect uh, their constituents, they need to be hearing from their constituents more and not just industry. And so... You know, that, that that's why it's important, you know, not just to take to Twitter um, and, and be that sort of armchair activist, as we like to say, um, but, you know, fundraise. If, if, if you live in a district and you're, you're a, a collector, an entrepreneur, uh, an investor, um, just a fan, there's no reason it's so easy to fundraise. It's so easy to just go and, and meet with your members and and. That, that's how you sway influence. And, and everyone has 10 friends they can go to and ask for, you know, $100 or something like that. I'm waiting for, you know, more sort of pack NFT collections to launch where the actual people can leverage that uh, to raise towards members that they feel are, are nice to the industry. But we need to do a better job at being less abrasive and more sort of high impact in the way that we're talking and realistic. The power of the people might once again, we'll see what, what is held in store for us in 2023 in the United States. And the world is watching. You, you make me more hopeful than I was maybe an hour ago. You know, the fact that 
that there are people that are still there, that W Coin is still engaged in ac- advocacy and the sort of tried and true method of just picking up the phone and writing an email and appealing to your member of Congress to really educate them on how the industry impacts your life is really meaningful. And the other thing that's meaningful, madam, is you have a little entrepreneurship streak in you that, uh, that spreads sweetness, as it were, all across Washington, D.C. Tell me about that. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Everyone is a side hustle. Mine just happens to be a sweet one. (laughs) 15 years or 16 years ago, I started Dolce Gelati uh, with my husband. We are an artisan, all natural gelato company. Kind of a funny story. He's Italian. His family had gelaterias in Italy and he moved here and was a pastry chef at a fine dining restaurant in DC. And at the time I was actually leading uh, marketing and uh, for, for Peroni beer. Um, it was acquired by Miller and they wanted yeah, to yeah, rebrand yeah, it as Italian style in a bottle. Um, and so I got to know a lot of the industry as well. And we decided to do it in the beginning, doing um, wholesale distribution. So my other fun fact is I'm a factory owner. <laughs> and we literally started off on the back of a Vespa. Um, we just gathered Dixie cups and a whole bunch of flavors and we dropped them off to pastry chefs all over the city and now we've grown it immensely we um sell uh, all over dc and and the region um we also have a big contract with the national zoo and the national stadium um we have another big location coming soon right near amazon hq2 which we're very so a little bit of alpha we haven't officially announced yet but it's coming Yay. Um, and, um, you know, we, we sell all over to restaurants and, uh, we do a ton of parties and catering. We make hundreds of flavors and some of my favorites right now, um, Valentine's day is our vanilla rose, which is so good. I love love rose anything. I love rose flavored everything. Rose and cardamom is like. Such an on brand. <laughs> okay, so vanilla rose. What are your other favorites? Oh my god, it's so mood driven because obviously in summer I love like our basil mint watermelon. It's so good, um, and then we have like a peach honey um, gelato. Um, I love some of our classics like mint chocolate chip. My husband makes his own speculus cookies, and <laughs> we whip that into gelato, which is another favorite. Um, what else? Oh, all of the flavors that we did for the holidays were amazing. We had a fresh gingerbread gelato, um, candy cane, chocolate chip, which was amazing. Eggnog, which is spiked and delicious. Um, we also have this amazing vegan line. So all of our sorbets are vegan. They're all fat-free, dairy-free. Um, but we found that even people who are vegan want the creaminess that comes with the gelato. So we have a whole line. We uh, My husband makes his own oat milk. Um, and we have uh, oat milk line. And we use soy milk, coconut milk. So good. We have like our salted caramel coconut milk is like to die for. It's so good. No, this is so, you guys are so terribly chic. It's like almost scary and offensive. Like you factory owner, crypto mining, started on the back of a Vespa with your beloved (laughs) husband who makes his own cookies. Come on, literally get out. (laughs) Okay, wait, what was, what's the most dodgy flavor you've ever, you guys have ever workshopped or tried? What is the, where's the place you will not, your palate will dare not go. Well, I, I, I love to say that I'm like the inspiration behind the creative flavors, but sometimes he's just, he's a, cre- he's like a, a creative genius. So he gets on these kicks, like a couple years ago for Cinco de Mayo, he did a guacamole flavor and he was like really excited about it. And I was like, I just can't. And there was another one he did actually when he um, was the executive pastry chef at a Galileo restaurant, his head chef, Roberto Donna, was on mm. Top Chef. Yeah. And, um, or sorry, the Iron Chef. Yeah. And so for that, it was like a whole lobster theme. So he made a Whoa. lobster gelato, which was oh. also kind of gross. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so those are like the yucky ones. But he's got, oh, oh, the the other one he brought home this week, which was really good. Um, for Valentine's Day, he made these little cheesecake um heart tarts with a graham cracker crust and then he decided to take those and like mix it into a gelato too amazing so it's like this kind of cheesecake graham cracker crust 
gelato. It's so good. I don't think that I could survive being married to someone who's drowning <laughs> me in such, you know, I don't know. I could probably hit a cheesecake sorbet every day. So I could hit a cheesecake gelato probably every day of my life and it wouldn't end well for anyone. Not sure about the lobster <laughs> though. I think that sounds, I'm, I, I think I'm I know, with you like, on that. Leave that. Yeah, yeah. Leave that to the the line between sort of genius and insanity, I guess, in gelato is probably yeah. very thin. Oh, Anastasia, it was so nice to meet you today. I was a big fan of your work and, you know, what you're doing with WCoin. I want everyone to make sure that they hit the advocacy page there. We'll have your blog, your contact info down below, and uh, we'll be looking for some of that vanilla and rose sweetness when they come down to D.C. to appeal to their member of Congress. Yeah, that's true. Stop by. Hey, if you come by after you go on the hill and make your rounds, maybe we'll give you something special. Ah, I love it. You <laughs> see? Maybe, maybe we need to like do like a summer sort of incentive plan. <laughs> I mean, they were doing it at the CVS for vaccines. I feel like yours is way cooler. <laughs> <laughs> Gelato advocacy for crypto. Gelato advocacy it. for crypto. I like it. I think that's a first. We could probably... There's probably an NFT in there somewhere. Oh, have a, <laughs> it was so cool talking to you. And you, thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, you too. I will, uh, I'll see you on the hill. Our time is up for now, but the conversation is still going. Make sure to follow us on Twitter at Sino Global Cap, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and leave us your feedback so we can loop it into upcoming episodes.